justice. For anyone on the bench of the Nigerian judiciary, this chamber is the ultimate. Let us all strive to maintain the independence of the judiciary so as to ensure the rule of law. And the fact that the ministry is responsible for prosecution of cases makes the ministry very visible naturally. If it is to buy time, you know who is buying time. Becoming the first woman in the country to discharge the function. To me, Allah wishes that. Welcome to the program, The Scale of Justice. Tune in every Monday at 2.05 p.m. And the repeat broadcast comes up every Wednesday at 6.30 a.m. on the network service of the NTA. Keep it date with us. Hello, welcome to The Scale, that program that dissects the happenings in the third arm of government, that is the judiciary, and we also go into law and uh, get you uh, accustomed with the happenings in that sector of our government. I am Femi Okewo with the pleasure of welcoming you to the program. We are looking at the appointment of judicial officers in the judiciary of Nigeria. Justices of the Supreme Court and justices of the Court of Appeal and then judges of the other courts, the courts of records. Of recent, we noticed that this appointment have not been adhered to strictly by the definition and stipulation of the Constitution. Even when the Constitution gives guidelines as to how these judicial officers are appointed, there are controversies that have surrounded the appointment of judicial officers in recent times. We have therefore gone out to educate ourselves more on how this process goes, and we have spoken to high-ranking members of the Nigerian Bar to see whether these appointments have been followed strictly according to the Constitution and what can be done to ensure that the third arm of government is respected in terms of how appointments are made for judicial officers. So join us as we speak to um, learned personalities on this sector. It is the responsibility of the State Judicial Service Committee uh, under the chairmanship of the CJ to recommend to the governor whether there are vacancies, suitable persons who are fit and proper to be judges to be appointed. Then such appointment, such recommendation will go to the National Judicial Council. The National Judicial Council will consider the qualifications and eligibility of that candidate, having regard to the background, information they have about him. If they find him suitable, the constituent is clear about who can be a judge anyway. But there are some other th um, qualifications that are not mentioned there. If you are not a man of character, in other words, you are not, fit, um, you are not a fit and proper person to become a judge, that can count against you. 
Once the NGC approves, they send it to the judge, to the governor, the governor will just swear them in. If it's federal officers, the federal high courts, the national industrial courts, and the federal capital territory high courts, they are handled by NGC. Permit me to, let's talk about the state a little bit more. We are finding state governors who are going ahead to swear in candidates who are, that were not necessarily nominated by the Niger National Judicial Council. Such appointments are aberrations. And in the past, I know that one or two gentlemen who, who succumbed or who acceded to the invitation of their governor to be appointed CJs have lost their jobs. So for the office of the CJ is peculiar. The CJ must be, must be recommended by the National Judicial Council. You know, what happened was that politicians have a way of undermining due process. Judiciary or legal profession with value rank and experience. If there are 10 judges in the state, from the, day, from the, re from the record, we'll see who is the most senior. Who is next to, to, to him or her? Above them all is the CJ. So what you find in some, in some states is political interference into the independence of judiciary in, at the state level. And of course, it's because everything is now politicized. Yes, the state is independent from the federal. But in the order of judiciary, in the hierarchy of judiciary, yes. the state forms part of the national judicial system. Okay. Therefore, okay. the states must go through the due process. Okay. You have situations where uh, some states do not like the man who is to be, or the woman who is to be the CJ. Mm -hmm. they, will, or they will bypass him and take his juniors or her juniors. Okay. Such is an undermining the integrity of the judiciary. And what, that is dangerous. What if the state uh, finds anything against the person who is supposed to be the number one, the next in hierarchy? Oh, the proper thing is to notify the National Judicial Council okay. and say, we are sorry, we do not find this candidate or this judge suitable to be the CJ for these reasons. Not to go to the House of Assembly. No, no, the House of Assembly has no business in who becomes the CJ. We do only have a, a, a business to do with it after the National Judicial Council has approved the nomination or the recommendation of the State Judicial Service Commission or Judicial Service Committee. We have been talking about the chief judges. No, of judges, the state. judges, I, judges, judges of the state yes. are appointed by the state upon recommendation okay. of the State Judicial Service Committee. Okay. That committee is headed by the CJ. Okay. Attorney General of the state is a member okay. and some other members. And therefore, when they consider a candidate suitable for appointment, they recommend to the National Judicial Council. National Judicial Council will look at his papers. They will look at his antecedents. They will look at comments. Because many people comment about appointment recommendations. And they investigate their allegations of uh, inappropriate conduct or um, background that is unfit for a judicial officer, and they they also recommend. So it is the, 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 after screening by the state, National Judicial Council also screen and then send recommendations to the state for appointment. Okay. Um, so for the federal, I was federal, talking about yes. the federal, and, uh, just like the states, candidates who are qualified to be judges are recommended to the CJ, the CJ will take you to the Federal Judicial Service Commission. The Federal Judicial Service Commission will screen the candidates. They will recommend to the NJC. Then NJC will now give approval. For certain offices, they need the approval of the president because the constitution says they need it. In FGSC, the president has two nominees of men of integrity, men of impeccable integrity in the FGSC. So they are part and parcel of the uh, screening and 
acceptance of candidature recommended for appointment to federal judicial service. So by the time it gets to NJC, NJC will also look at the recommendations of the FGSC. They will look at the, the antecedent. If there are petitions against them, they will also ask for security clearance. Because, you see, security clearance is very, is very important. Many, there are many things that are not in the face of the books or that people may, may hide. But security investigation will expose it. So, FJC, NJC, they've done all the screening that ought to be done. So by the time it gets to the president, it's just formality, in my view. For me, there ought to be institutional respect. Are we suggesting that um, men or women of FJC and NJC are not men of integrity who can, who can display um, integrity in the appointment of a judge? We must seriously underscore the issue of financial autonomy of the judiciary. For instance, if justices of the Supreme Court are to be appointed, and we are aware that some of them have long been recommended for appointment and they are still not yet appointed, one will also ask that question. Do they have some of these uh, complements of uh, infrastructural uh, facilities in place? Sometimes the NJC goes ahead to make, make its recommendations and we find that the process of verifying these candidates takes a dual, a doubly long time because the executive too, whether at the state or federal level, does another set of verifications. Yes, it, it, I think that is understandable, understandable but like I've always argued, uh, we cannot wish away the fact that in the democratic experiment that we found ourselves in, constitutionally and otherwise, the issue of the doctrine of separation of powers has a lot to do in the sense that we are not like America where judge, judges and justices are elected to positions. We are here, you know, circumscribed by the idea of having the three arms of government working together in appointing uh, a judicial officer. But to what extent can we push the executive arm of government? Mm -hmm. And to what extent can we push the National Assembly? We've seen in return times that there have been instances where the National Assembly can, within 48 hours, yes. confirm mm -hmm. an appointment to a judicial office. At, at least we saw that with that of the President of the Court of Appeal. Yes. So to that extent, we feel that the National Assembly can hurry itself yes. if it is not hurried. Yes. But what can we say about the executive? Because it is the president that makes the appointment based on the recommendation of the National Judicial Council subject to the confirmation. So how soon, how soon, how fast does the recommendation of the president f fly or flow or go to the National Assembly? That is the critical question. I think I've had cause to argue. That again, when in matters of this nature, excluding the issue of financial autonomy, perhaps there might be need for us to tinker a little with the Constitution in the sense that we put a timeline or a time frame in the sense that the President, upon recommendation by the National Judicial Council, shall, within a given period, okay. one month, yes. six weeks, yes. eight weeks, push this appointment to the National, National Assembly. Assembly for confirmation. Mm -hmm. If we're able to do that, I believe we can save ourselves a lot of uh, challenges in that regard. Because we have backlog of cases littered all over the place. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court says the Chief Justice of Nigeria and a complement of 21 justices. Mm -hmm. How many do we have, especially with a litany of retirements mm -hmm. all over the place and no replacement? means that those who are there now are overworked. But again, we have to ask ourselves, do we have offices for 21 justices of the Supreme Court? Do we have the money? That shouldn't be our problem, because I believe strongly that if the independence of the judiciary is fully 
pushed not just to the letters but to the spirit. And the issue of financial autonomy comes to the fore. I believe that we can afford all these things easily because the justice sector is a critical aspect of our democratic experiment and we cannot toy with it. Not with the number of cases that flies to the Supreme Court at any point in time and to other courts. We must have that at the back of our mind. I am con conscious of the fact as well that at the state level, the, the problems seem to be even more controversial as the case may be. But I have looked at it and I think the controversy rests more with the appointment of chief judges than with the appointment of judges. Chief judges in the sense that this idea of all arms of government, the three arms of government participating one way or the other is clear and comes to the fore easily. And then the state assembly. Now, in terms of the challenges, the governors usually hide under the cover of the state assembly to reject candidates ordinarily that they ought not to reject. But I am comfortable with the provisions of Section 270 as it affects state courts and uh, some of these other courts, especially with reference to ordinary judges. I normally use the expression ordinary, but to distinguish between them and the chief judge. Because it just simply says the governor appoints on the recommendation of the National Judicial Council. What does that mean? It presupposes that you don't have anywhere to hide. Once the National Judicial Council recommends, you have to appoint. That is as far as judges are concerned. In that regard, if you feel that you want to do anything, lobby for instance, you have to come to the National the Judicial, Judicial Council. Council. And that strengthens the authority and the power of the Judicial Council in that regard. But when that is taken away from them and pushed to the State Assembly to, to an extent, that's where we have issues. So a person recommended for the position of a chief judge is now said to be either a non-indigent mm -hmm. or uh, not qualified or gender biased or any of those excuses. When the NJC would have looked at his qualification. The NJC would have fully, fully scrutinized yeah. and done every fact checking before recommending to know that from antecedents in the area of competence, in the area of capacity, in the area of performance evaluation, um, in the area of character, amongst other things, that he or she is a fit and proper person to head the judiciary of a state. And then we are now confronted with some of these challenges and controversies. When you're talking about judicial appointments in this country, the first place to go to is the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended. The Constitution shares and divides powers between the three arms of government in relation to judicial appointments. The legislative arm of government will play a role, the executive will play a role, and even the judiciary will play a role as well. In particular reference to, with specific reference to appointment of judges of courts of record, yes. take the high courts of the states for example, it is the Judicial Service Commission of the state itself that sends a shortlist okay. to the governor of the state. Yeah. So ever before the matter of appointment of a judge gets to the NJC, it goes to the governor first yeah. through the Judicial Service Commission of the state. Thereafter, or contemporaneously, the notice is sent to the NJC as well. And the NJC has uh, rules of procedure governing appointment of uh, judges. And these rules are available on the website, on the NJC website, so it's nothing hidden. Any Nigerian can go and find out what the procedural rules are for the appointment of judges. Now, the NJC receives a short list of, uh, say, double by their procedural rules they require double the number of what you of what they what you want to what, appoint, what, what, what you want to appoint. You appoint. exactly they're supposed to be a reserve list exactly so in the event that two judges are to be appointed a list of a minimum of four is sent 
in the event that five, ten, and so on and so forth. Now, the NJC then conducts interviews, carries out background checks, etc., works with other agencies before eventually making a recommendation to the governor in the case of uh, state judges. So eventually, it, the NJC does not make appointments. The NJC recommends to the governor based on initial recommendation to the NJC by the State Judicial Service Commission. And when the governor takes or selects or appoints, that's a better word, appoints a judge recommended by the NJC, the matter does not end there. The constitution shares the powers such that the, if it's a CJ yes. of the state, as you in particular reference to your question, the CJ's appointment is then sent to the House for uh, confirmation. But judges are not sent. The constitution does not require the governor to send the judge, appointed judges to the House for confirmation. Uh, so if, they, if a governor does that, it's just surplusage. Are the governors under any compulsion to take the recommendations of NJC since the initial uh, list emanated from the states? Excellent question, Mr. Keo. Now, the constitution says that the judge to be appointed by the governor must be the one recommended by the NJC. So initially, we talked about division and separation and sharing of powers. Now, the people that drafted our constitution had some foresight. In relation to the appointment of judges, the constitution provides that the governor will appoint the person recommended by the NJC. Now, the foresight the drafters of the constitution had relates to a problem that is, perver that is everywhere in this country, and that is um, communitarian solidarity. We have groups and allegiances and so on, and that plays out in many aspects of our national life. So if the governor is uh, empowered to just appoint anyone he wants, he may not conduct an interview like the NJC does, he may not receive a short list from the Judicial Service Commission like the NJC does, he may not um, do background checks like the NJC does, he may just carry on as people do in many other things. Really, banking on communitarian solidarity and then appointing someone who he feels is um, loyal to him or her, as the case may be. So that's a problem that the framers of our constitution envisaged and then made it that a body independent of the governor recommends the judicial office holder to the governor for appointment. Indeed, the governor does not play any role in investigating and interviewing and ensuring that the person is fit for that role. And indeed, the governor doesn't even have the capacity. The NJC is uh, made up of eminent members of the legal profession and who are best qualified to interview people who want to hold judicial offices. So, in direct answer to your question, the governor cannot or should not appoint someone other than the one recommended by the NJC. Yes, I hope this program has been able to shed light on what the appointment of judicial officers should be like, the duties of the National Judicial Council and the Federal Judicial Service Commission, and uh, indeed the executive arm too, have a role to play. Thank you for being part of the program today. We shall be raising more issues in the weeks to come, and we hope that you will not miss out on our attempt to illuminate the scene in the justice sector. We'll see you again.
Thank you.